I landed in Mogadishu, the capital of Somalia, in September 2011. This was in the midst of one of the worst famines this country had ever faced. In those days, you landed on a small runway, just on the edge of the ocean, this blue, sparkling, beautiful ocean that Somalia's coast runs along. But Mogadishu itself was in rubble. Hundreds of thousands of people had fled drought and war and were huddled in the ruins. This is a picture of me in one building. These are just bullet holes in the wall of this building. We landed there in a cargo plane. I felt a little bit like Indiana Jones. Not many people flew into Mogadishu in those days. There weren't any seats. The pilot was smoking a cigarette as we landed. We were clinging on to this kind of netting on the back of the cargo. And we got out with a little bit of relief. And we had immediately 16 armed guards. It's the only place in my whole life, working for Save the Children and Oxfam, actually, that I've ever gone anywhere with armed protection. And these were young Somalis armed to the teeth. And we drove off into the centre of town. And we went to a little refugee camp called Sigali. This was right in the centre of Mogadishu. It was a camp that literally a few days before had been run by Al-Shabaab. I think Al-Shabaab in those days was the affiliate of Al-Qaeda. I think it's now an affiliate of ISIS. So it was bullet hold. There was mortar shell still in the camp. And I met this little girl, Nestea, age two, and her mum, Suban. Nestea had walked at the age of two, for four days, fleeing conflict, fleeing violence, fleeing the drought, to find safety in this refugee camp. She was dehydrated, she had diarrhea, and she was close to death. You know when little children like that are close to death, I've seen it quite a few times, sadly, because they're listless, they kind of fade in and out, their eyes don't quite focus on you when you look at them. And our expert frontline Somali team rushed her. We'd put up a mobile hospital in this refugee camp, a tent. And they pulled her back from the brink of death with a saline drip. I think I've got one of the other things that we gave her, this plumpy nut mixture, which is just peanut butter with nutrients. It's magical. I've seen again how this saves so many children's lives. And a few antibiotics. And they saved her life in front of my eyes. And over the next month, she was sent to a bigger hospital and she gradually recovered. And a year later, I was back in Mogadishu in slightly better circumstances. And I met this little girl and her mother again, healthy and transformed from that simple intervention that those Save the Children frontline nurses and doctors made. And the reason I wanted to tell you the story about little Nastea and Suban, is because it's a story of hope. It told me in my first year or so at Save the Children that even in these very tough circumstances, in one of the worst places in the world to be a child, you can save children's lives. And as Bill Gates has argued, much more eloquently than I can tonight, that Nastea and children like her are part of a much bigger trend, that overall we are managing to re dramatically reduce the number of children dying from preventable causes. And that now, because of that progress, not just in the toughest places in the world, but all across our planet, we could now aim even higher, and we could be that first generation to end children dying from preventable causes. You might say the kind of fault line for finance is greed. You know, it's yeah. in the sense that it's greed which leads to people doing the wrong kind of thing. Is it perversely that in the charitable sector it's the sense of righteousness that leads people to doing the right? It's that sense of we're doing the right thing, so therefore cold calling people to get money out of mm. them or chugging or, you know, or the excesses of a kid's company. Well, that's, that's, in a sense, that's justified by people's sense of we know we're right. I, do, I agree with that, actually. That's interesting. We, we haven't had that conversation before, but I think the biggest weakness um, of any organisation, of any leadership, is, is self-righteousness and the lack of self-doubt. And I think charities, because they do believe so strongly in what they're doing, sometimes don't ask questions about themselves. 
without telling a long story. I learned that lesson. I worked with people in South Africa, and particularly the African National Congress, and one of the most respected leaders of the ANC that ran the military wing of the ANC during the dying days of apartheid, always used to say to me that he thought the most important ingredient of leadership was self-doubt. And I think if you don't have leaders who reflect on, on, on whether they're making the right decisions and, don't, and are so self-righteous, people that believe they're so right they can do anything are the ones that are most dangerous. And I, I, I do think in the charity sector, you, that probably has been the contributory factor to some of those mistakes are made. All I would say on the fundraising thing is I also think there's another thing at, uh, afoot there, which is that we outsourced it to other companies and then didn't monitor them strongly enough. And I think we have to look at how we engage the public directly, not just always through outsourcing.